What's good? Welcome to Dave's Desk. I'm Dave, and in today's video, we're going to take a state of the Ottawa real estate market. Okay, let's dive in and let's talk about what's going on in Ottawa real estate. So yesterday, a big notable announcement came out from the Bank of Canada. Uh, they have increased interest rates another 50 basis points, and that's coming off of their last announcement in April. They raised it 50 basis points then. That's a total of 1% over the last few months, so uh, some notable action and measures being taken by the Bank of Canada. So what are they doing? They're trying to fight off inflation. We've seen it everywhere. We've seen it at gas prices. We've seen it in, uh, in the grocery stores. We've seen it in building supplies, all this. So a CPI, which is the con Consumer Price Index, it's the, the number one tool that they have to measure inflation, it's reached 6.8%. And the Bank of Canada has a target to keep that around 2%. So we're way over their target, and they're taking action to fight against inflation and return the, con the economy to a stable and uh, predictable target inflation rate. So they have two tools in their tool belt to make this happen. The first one is called quantitative tightening. That's the opposite of quantitative easing. But under quantitative tightening, is that they basically will allow bonds like Canada Savings Bonds to mature and not reissue them or reissue at least less of them. And that will uh, contract or shrink the monetary supply and that brings inflation down. It is one good tool, but a better tool. Their number one uh, weapon in their arsenal is to control interest rates. And so that's what they're doing here. They're playing with this universal economic law that there is an inverse relationship between inflation and interest rates. When interest rates are low, you can be sure that inflation is going to get high. And when inflation is high, that to break it down, you got to raise interest rates. And so economists and the Bank of Canada are always striving to keep this in balance and check where they want to provide a lower interest rates to stimulate the economy, give consumers the ability and the affordability to buy the essentials that they need, like home, uh, housing, while at the same time not keeping it too low because then inflation can run rapid, rampant. So they need to keep that in check. And uh, we've been running at a low interest rate environment for so long that the inflation is now catching up to us and starting to get out of control. So in their announcement, they took this uh, action to raise interest rates. They also give a warning. If you read the whole article at the end there, they talk about if in, uh, inflation continues to, to rise, and they think that it might in the short term, that they're prepared to take even more powerful measures, i.e. they will increase their interest rates even more. But for now, uh, this is the new interest rate environment we have, and we're going to assess then what does this mean for um, people in Ottawa, across Ontario and Canada, what does this mean for our housing market? Let's talk a little bit more about inflation, though, and what is inflation? So, excuse me while I move my face around a bit. What is inflation? Most people would think of inflation as the cost of goods and services going up, and that is true, but I think a better description is the purchasing power of the dollar going down. And uh, let me talk about uh, real assets versus financial assets to really il illustrate this, okay? So a financial asset, things like cash, money market, mutual funds, stocks, options, derivatives. If I said bonds, I'm not sure, but those are included too. Uh, these are all financial assets, and they are all vulnerable to inflation, where, uh, like, take cash as the worst offender, if you're holding cash in your bank account or in your wallet, in your sock drawer, wherever, the cash is literally eroding right now. It's wasting away. Uh, it, the purchasing power of that money is constantly being threatened and going down. And it's because we live in a fiat currency. It's no longer tied to a gold standard. We're not going to go into a long history there, but it's, um, it's a fiat currency and it's vulnerable to inflation, which means that the purchasing power of that money goes down. Compare that to a real asset. In a high inflationary period, financial assets will lose value, but real assets will hold value. Take, for example, gold or other precious metals. When inflation is high, the price of those metals go up. Same is true for real estate. Real estate is a tangible asset. It's a real asset. You can touch it. You can walk through the front door. Uh, you can take shelter under the roof, right? It's a real value a real asset. So the intrinsic value of that home, if you take a th your, your three bedroom, three bathroom home in Orleans, and you know that that home is the same intrinsic value today as it was two years ago. It's the same value as it will be two years from now, like in the future. 
So past, present, and future, the intrinsic value of that home remains constant. And, you know, assuming that you keep up with the maintenance and all that good stuff. Yes, there's maintenance costs. But go with me on this. The intrinsic value is constant. There's, it's the same number of bedrooms, same number of bathrooms. The roof keeps you just as dry as it did before. There's the same number of square footage. The home hasn't magically grown and gotten bigger and increased in value that way. It is constant. Uh, but it, it, what's changed is the purchasing power of our dollar has gone down, and now it takes more dollars to purchase the same real asset. So the nominal value of the home has gone up. The intrinsic value has stayed the same. Okay, so that's the difference between real assets and, and financial assets. And so I highlight that because real estate is a real asset, and it's a shelter against inflation. So that's a good place to be already. Let's talk about the interest rate changes here. And let's talk about what does this mean immediately for buyers and the the impact on affordability for buyers, okay? So if you went to the bank a month or two ago and you applied for a pre-approval, they may have quoted you an interest rate around 4.15%. And assume you had about $150,000 to use as a down payment. Maybe based on your credit application, uh, the bank said you can go buy a home up to $750,000. That's with the 20% down, $150,000 down, a mortgage of 600 amortized over 25 years with a mortgage rate of 4.15%, your mortgage payment would come out to roughly $3,200, $3,205. So that's what you can afford. So then you go shopping. Now you haven't found something and you're still shopping and interest rates have suddenly gone up on you and you have to go back to the bank and reapply uh, for an you know for a renewed interest rate. So they now quote you 4.65. What does that mean for you? Well, you still have that $150,000 down payment, you can still afford that 3205 mortgage payment every month, but it, it's an impacted the, your purchase price. You can now only afford up to 720500 right? At this rate, with that much down over that a year at this interest rate, your mortgage payment is still at 3205 the same interest rate as the old, sorry, the same mortgage payment as when under the old interest rate. So what's changed? You have lost $29,500 in purchasing power that is roughly a 5%, a little bit more than 5%. I didn't check my math on that one, but um, the point, because 37, so a little, little under 5% um, decrease in affordability. Okay, so that's the impact. So what does that mean for the short term in the, bar, in the Ottawa real estate market? Well, yeah, maybe prices will go down a little bit because the, the affordability of buyers have gone down. But then we start get, like wondering, well, how far will prices drop? And we've already seen prices drop in the last month, and maybe they'll drop a little bit more in the short term because of these changes uh, to in interest rates. So, but is this going to be a bubble? Are we going to see uh, prices just plummet? And uh, are we going to lose much of the equity that's been built in recent years? So let's talk about that a little bit more. Home buyers, let's, and to talk about that, we need to back it up. Take a big picture, really simple terms. If you're a buyer, you can shop for a home in one of two places. You can go buy a home resale from the Ottawa real estate market, and you can connect with us. We love helping people uh, buy and sell homes. Or you can go buy a home from a new construction. We can help there too. But those are the two places that you can purchase a home. Easy, common sense. With the cost of goods and services going up, like the cost of goods going higher than ever, what will happen to construction costs? Cost to construct will remain high. Extra costs will be absorbed by consumers. So let, let me ask another question. Do you think we'll see gas prices return to $1.50 a liter, $1.60 a liter? Do, we, do you think we'll see lumber prices return to what they were two years ago? Do you think we'll see food prices go back to where they were? Maybe food is not the best example here because it's, uh, it's not used in the construction of homes, but you know, lumber, metals, plastics, glass, all these construction materials, uh, are those prices going to return to what they were two years ago? And I'm going to suggest no, they're not. That the cost of these goods, and because of inflation and where the economy is going, uh, these are setting new high watermarks and prices are not likely to go back to where they were. So the cost of constructing these homes is not going back down. It's going to remain high. And therefore, builders have to factor that into their margin, their profit margins, when constructing and selling homes. Let's do a case study. 
So uh, right now, if you look for a two bed, two bath condo in around the Canada Stittsville area, you can go, and I'm not picking on Mattamy, they're wonderful. We love working with Mattamy. Uh, but if you go on their website right now, they're advertising their two bed, one bath, two bed, one bath, two bed. Yeah, these are all, and they're uh, two bed, one bath. And they, oh, one half bath, excuse me. So they are two bed, two bath. Thank you. Okay. So, and they're advertised around $550,000. Now, I don't know what the, what I'm going to say next. I don't know if it's true for Mattamy. But um, regardless of the builder you're buying from, Something you want to be aware of is read their purchase contracts very carefully. Maybe even have your lawyer review because their cost to construct is so uncertain. They're, it's so precarious for them right now that they're having a difficult time forecasting the cost to, com com to complete the construction over the next 12 to 24 months. That when you go in and you pay, you know, there's, it's advertised at this price and you sign the purchase agreement that number may be subject to change based on cost of construction, okay? So I don't know if that's true for Mattamy, but it's just a warning uh, across the board when you're looking to buy a new build, read the, the contracts very carefully because the purchase price that's being discussed right now may not be the final purchase price upon completion and it could be adjusted based on uh, increased cost to construction. Okay, let's return to the case study here. So they're being advertised for $550,000 when similar homes, and these are homes, they're only built in the last one or two years. I have uh, a close friend who just uh, moved into this, one of these units, and um, they're, they close within the last one or two years. So they're virtually brand new. And you can see here that right now, many of them are being advertised for sale under 500,000. And if you look at the last 30 days, uh, we have three of them who have sold under 500,000. We have one that has sold, and that's a, uh, yeah, that's sold for 548. So my point is, as a consumer then, consumers are smart, buyers are smart. They're gonna shop for value. They're gonna look, what can I get new from the builder? Oh, I have to pay 550 for it, versus what can I go pay on the market Oh, I only have to pay 480 for it. Let's go buy that resale home. And so if we if we believe that the cost to construct these homes will remain high, we can infer their profit, you know, they have to keep a profit margin somewhere in there that maybe their profit margins are super high right now and there is room for them to lower their prices a little bit, but there is a floor to that that they cannot lower their prices beyond a certain point for the sheer fact of cost of construction. So this is, the, in many ways, the new construction builds are going to anchor market prices because of the cost of construction. So I believe that while it's true that in the short term, just as we've seen here, prices can fall in the short term, but I think they're going to be anchored in a way because of inflation, because of real assets, and because of cost of constructions, I don't think prices just can just plummet and the, the floor fall out from the, uh, from the market on that, okay? Let's talk about average prices. So I have the 10 year and the five year. This is in Ottawa. And you can see like the average resale price, the kind of the, and it goes up and down, up and down, and up and down, and up and down. But as, and that's these small dips, like peaks and valleys are almost month to month. And you can really see it more pronounced when you look at the shorter time period of five years, that these peaks and valleys are more pronounced. But in the long term, if you were to average it out, you know, real estate is a safe and predictable investment class. It goes up in value for the reasons we've already discussed. And if you look at the 65 year average, you know, this really illustrates the point. And if, uh, if I were to show you the table of data, there was maybe three, four, five year, uh, excuse me, years where the value of homes went down like 1%, 2%, maybe at most 4% in one year. And the prices always bounce back within three, four or five years. Like if you bought here and then for a couple of years you lost money, but then by, so if you bought in 1993, let's say, by 1999, so six years later, you've recovered that loss. And that would, might be the, the biggest peak and valley that we've seen in the auto real estate market. Now, of course, we, we have to address the elephant in the room. You know, this is pretty, if we were to draw the line at the angle of this line would be, similar to where I'm showing the cursor here, and then boom, it goes like vertical almost. So we certainly have a, a, had a much, much, much higher appreciation 
since 2018, you know, for the last four years. Um, so what does that mean? I think it's going it, to, we agree it's going to plateau. It's going to come back. It cannot con continue at this trajectory. I don't think it's going to just plummet for the reasons I just explained before. And I'm going to show you some more uh, data to, to further emphasize that point. So people are saying, oh, there's a market shift. There's a market shift. And it feels like things are swinging back the other way uh, that you know buyers are now in control of the transaction process. It used to be this, a seller's mark, but now things aren't selling anymore. And this is the perception that we hear in the news and that people are being talked about. So let me throw some data at this to really illustrate where we're at. The 10-year average of months of inventory is 5.36. For example, if you were shopping in the middle of spring of 2015, there was 12 months supply of homes on the market. That means there was tons of options available to you. You, you want a, a two bed, two bath condo in Stittsville? Well, not maybe these ones were construction, but you know, your, your home in Barhaven or Orleans or Finley Creek or wherever else, there was probably like five, six, seven, eight identical units for sale. There was a plethora of choice. As a buyer, you could go shop the mall and pick your favorite one. Uh, right now, we're at 1.63 months. So we're down here. And the five-year average is somewhere around, you know, between five and six. So we are still well below the average amount of inventory. This suggests that we are still in a seller's market. There is not a lot of choice for buyers to choose from, period. Uh, there may be more than we had three months ago, but we are still very far from the average inventory level uh, over the last 10-year trend. If we look at the cumulative days on market, this further illustrates the point. The 10-year median cumulative days on market is 30 days. That means you put your home for sale uh, on average or on median, your home would take 30 days to sell. And right now, people are kind of freaking out that, oh my goodness, my home didn't sell in the first five days. Yeah, that's okay. It's okay that your home didn't sell in the first five days. In fact, the 10-year uh, the average is it would take 30 days for your home to sell. Right now, our current median cumulative days on market is nine. So we are still way below the median cumulative days on market, okay? Also suggesting we're still in a seller's market. What does this mean, like how to, how to drive this point home? I think we, like if you take a, a gauge here and you look at, you know, way on the left side, you have a buyer's market. They have control all the power. And on the right side, you have a seller's market where the sellers hold all the power. And somewhere in the middle is you have what's a balanced market where it's balanced, things are good, uh, equal power to the buyers and the sellers, and it's normal, fair negotiations. For the last one to two years, and you know what, maybe even three or four years, we've been here, like the needle's been way over here. The pendulum's way over on the seller's market. Like if you were to, to take a group of people and put them in a closed room and say, dream up for me, the most absurd seller's market, what would that look like? We've lived it for the last couple of years. It's been crazy, stupid, and unhealthy. We, you know, Where people have to make offers cash, no financing options or conditions available to you. You are not allowed to do a home inspection. If you, do, if you ask for a home ins inspection, forget it. You're not going to win. Or you have to compete against 29 other offers, and they're all offering like $100,000 over asking price. No one would, like, if you put a group of people in a closed room, you, I don't even know if they could dream up a scenario like that. We've been living so long in this hot, extremely dumb seller's market where the moment things start to ease off, we start to wonder what's going on, what happened to the market. And all the data is still saying we're in a seller's market. And so uh, I just want to give a kind of a breath of reality, of calmness, Yes, the market has shifted. There's no denying that. Yes, prices have fallen a little bit. And you know what? Maybe prices will fall a little bit more. But it, real estate is still a fantastic uh, investment vehicle. Um, it's, it's, the history shows us that it holds value. It goes up over the long term. So there's my predictions. In the short term, I think multiple offers will no longer be common. I think we're done with that. There may be the odd case here and there. But for the most part, we're going to see less 
multiple offers. I think it's very reasonable to include a condition of financing when you write an offer. I think it's reasonable to include a condition of home inspection when you make an offer. And this is becoming more acceptable to sellers. As competition goes down, as buyer demand goes down a little bit, we can return a little bit to turn no normality. And it's reasonable to ask for these types of conditions. I think the days on market will grow longer, so we're at nine. I think it's okay if it grows to 12, to 15, to 20. I think that's okay. You know, even up to 30, that's still a balanced market. Even 45, I, I wouldn't get alarmed. 60 days, okay, now you start to wonder, right? Like, uh, but I think it's okay if the process slows down a little bit. I think it's okay if a buyer can wait till the weekend to go see the home and that they don't have to rush out to see it within 24 hours. I think these are signs of a healthy market. So I think it's okay that days on market will grow. I think this holding, withholding an offers strategy, I think that's done. I think now listing agents have to price homes at market value. If, don't do the withholding offers thing. If you want to, you can say 24 hour irrevocable, 48 hour irrevocable if you want. But I think we're done with the withholding offer period. As I said, prices may decline slightly, but the market will settle into a new normal way of negotiating offers. You know, it used to be where as an agent, as a buyer's agent, we'd have to counsel our buyers. Um, the, the role of a buyer's agent was try to negotiate as low as possible. And the role of a selling agent was to try to negotiate the price as high as possible. And so you're going back and forth, back and forth, trying to land somewhere in the middle and get the uh, buyer to agree and the seller to agree on a, on a fair price. In recent years, the negotiated negotiations has been my goodness how much higher do we have to go what do you think it'll take to secure this how much more over asking price do you think it'll take to win and it's been just throwing I don't know throwing darts sometimes at a board like how crazy is it gonna be this time I think it's, very, it's a healthy thing if we return more to a normal way of negotiating sellers are gonna want a high price buyers are gonna want a low price Let's find the, the, the common ground. Let's find a price in the middle. So I think that's going to uh, be the transition over the short term. I think in the long term, the Canadian dollar, dollar will continue to steadily lose purchasing power. I think inflation will continue, as it always has, like any other fiat currency. I think the cost to construct new homes will remain high. I don't think these costs to construct will go back down to where they were two years ago. Therefore, I think new construction home will anchor, in a way, uh, home prices, uh, and I think home prices will hold their value in the medium term and will go up in the long term. So wh it, where are you in this spectrum? Are you a homeowner Are you a, and you're thinking about selling? Uh, the thing about buying and selling is everyone needs a place to live. So whether you bought at the peak of the market or slightly off the peak of the market, maybe you bought recently and you're thinking, my goodness, did I overpay? It's maybe you could perceive it that way. But if you intend to live in the home for any extended period of time, you're going to recover that money. And likewise, I, I love this line, high tide raises all ships. If you go to sell, you're going to have to move somewhere else. And the prices of those homes have adjusted likely the same way as your current home. So whether you're upsizing, downsizing, whatever sizing, you know, trying to market time in and out, I think is the wrong answer it's the wrong question to be asking I think the right attitude to real estate is uh, don't wait to buy real estate buy real estate and wait I think I butchered that quote but the point is there right uh, don't wait to buy real estate buy real estate and wait it's a, a uh, fantastic asset class it's hedged against inflation whatever happens to the economy your family needs a place to sleep and real estate is a fantastic place to put your money so I hope that helps and brings some reassurance to wherever you are in the spectrum. I don't think the, it's a big giant bubble and the world's going to fall apart. I think prices might dip a tiny bit, but in the long run, there's nothing to be afraid of. I still think the fundamentally, like the fundamentals, the data still shows us we're in a, a, a seller's market. So that also reaffirms me. This isn't going to change super fast. Okay, so let me know what you think in the comments. Maybe shoot me a, a, a direct message if you want to have a personal conversation about this and what it means for you and your family. I'd love to have that conversation. I love this stuff. So thanks so much for watching. It's a longer video. Thanks for hanging in with me, and we'll talk to you later. Bye.